deadly shooting is a tragic event. Suppose a guy breaks into your house to steal your television. You confront him and he charges you. You shoot, he's dead. Now what? In today's court system, with the way lawyers twist and turn every word, you could very well end up looking like the bad guy, facing jail sentences, fines, and even worse. In fact, even if the shooting was justified, you could wind up in a civil lawsuit with the family of the deceased. All because this guy broke into your house. Masad Ayub is one of the most respected and experienced expert witnesses with respect to the use of firearms in self-defense and law enforcement situations. He's a writer, law enforcement officer, competition shooter, and an educator in the use of justifiable force involving firearms. He is the founder of Lethal Force Institute, LFI, instructing qualified individuals the skills needed to properly use firearms. In this program, Masad Ayub shares years of experience gathered in and out of courtrooms to help you be prepared for the aftermath of a gun-related incident. The particular emphasis of this program is to help you understand the word and mind games that lawyers will play to destroy the credibility of your testimony in front of a judge and a jury. Now, here's Masad Ayub with Cute Lawyer Tricks. We're glad to have you here today. My name is Kyle Bateman. I'm one of the directors of the Rocky Mountain Institute. And we're very pleased to have with us today a man who uh, is very distinguished in his field. He uh, is responsible with uh, some of the work he's done in court for uh, saving at least 20 careers of police officers that we know of. Uh, he's uh, kept at least six officers that we know of out of prison using these techniques. And uh, one man that we know of uh, was kept out of the electric chair. He spent countless hours in the defense of his fellow officers, and uh, we've asked him to come and address us on that subject today. I give you Masad Ayub. Thank you, Carl. Morning, team. It's a pleasure to be here with you. We're going to talk about uh, what I call, for want of a better term, legal weasel craft. Uh, all of you have uh, been in court against people who make six figures a year tearing cops apart, and the reason they make that money is that they're good at it. They learn their first week in law school that if the law is on your side, argue the law. If the facts are on your side, argue the facts. And if neither the law nor the facts are on your side, attack the character of the witness and attempt to assassinate it. We know your officer wouldn't have made the arrest or wouldn't have used the force that he did if the law and the facts were not on his side. This leaves opposing counsel with only one alternative. They call it destructive cross. Cross-examination designed to make an honest man who's telling the truth appear to be a liar. Uh, have any of you ever been sitting on the witness stand and all of a sudden you see the dorsal fin cut the water and you can sort of hear, da dum da dum da dum da dum Okay, how many of us, in fact, have a few shark teeth scars on us from that sort of testimony? Okay, you've got to understand where the attack will come, have your counter in place. Courtroom survival is the same as street survival. Know where the attack will come, have the counter in place. For example, if uh, I'm an attorney cross-examining Deputy Hughes and it's absolutely clear to me that he is in the right and uh, the only way I can earn my money and uh, get my judgment for my uh, fee and contingency is going to be to make him look like a liar when he's not. I'll do something like, Deputy Hughes, let me remind you that you are under oath and turn away. How many times have you seen that? And what is the opposing attorney trying to do? He's trying to plant in the mind of the jury that this man is a liar and for reasons I can't tell you, I don't believe he's telling the truth. That's totally unmeritorious. So how do you counter that? The answer is, counsel, I am well aware that I am under oath, just as I am aware that you are not. Do you ever see one of them take an oath to tell the truth in court? Of course not. Half of them would be gone tomorrow, and the other half would be hit by lightning bolts the second day. Similarly, they'll try to take statements out of context to use against you or the officer you're speaking in defense of. Let's say, for example, your officer was in a, a street fight with a savage psycho. The man is screaming, you fucking cop, I'm going to burn your house down and kill all your children. And the cop and I said, hey, shut up, asshole. Okay, well, now we have that in the report. And he comes up to you, you're the sergeant. He says, sergeant, uh, I'd like you to read from this line right here in the report. And he points to the part where your officer said, hey, shut up, asshole. Well, that's out of context, isn't it? 
And anyone hearing just that thinks only here's a vulgar, vicious, foul mouth cop because they haven't seen the provocation. It's been taken out of context. Well, you're not allowed to de determine which questions you will ask and which, will which you will answer. But what is your response to that when they try to take something out of context? Make it clear. Say, counsel, are you sure you want me to read that? That's out of context. It loses the meaning. At which time opposing counsel will say, just read what I told you to read. What do you reply? Guys, the truth is your armor. Look at him and say, counsel, I have sworn an oath in this court to tell the truth. And the oath was to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That tells me that the law and the oath bo both recognize that a statement out of context is not the whole truth and therefore is a lie. And for me to read what you have asked me to do, because you have not taken the oath I have, would make me a vehicle of perjury, and I cannot do so. Make that absolutely clear. If you are forced to read something out of context, your, the attorney for your side should be smart enough to, upon redirect examination of you, rehabilitate the witness, by which we mean he goes back to every statement you are forced to take out of context. Now you read them to the jury in context, and now two purposes are served. First, the jury knows the truth. Second, the jury now fully realizes the other attorney has lied to them and tried to lead them down the primrose path. Those of you who know me are aware that I am not Pollyanna, but I absolutely believe what I'm about to tell you. The truth is your strongest weapon. The truth will set you free in these things. For those of you in the firearms field, think of the truth as a bullet. And I will give you this analogy. Uh, most of you in the firearms training field are familiar with the name Robbie Latham. Latham is the current world speed shooting champion, is generally conceded to be the finest combat pistol shot who's ever lived, and in his mid-twenties has not yet reached the height of his powers. And in this example, we say that you are going to shoot against him, one-on-one, -on -one, and the stakes are your career and every nickel of estate you've ever built for your children. That's just what the stakes are when you go into court. Well, what are your chances shooting in a match against Robbie Latham? Uh, are we reminded of a certain snowball in a warm place? But suppose we turn the match around and we say, all right, you've got to shoot against Robbie Latham, but he has blanks, and we'll let you use live ammo. Who now has the edge? And that's the difference. Going in a court, why are cops afraid to go in a court? Because they see opposing counsel as Robbie Latham. This man is in his own ballpark. He's gone through three years of law school learning all the subtleties, has learned more about uh, legal tactics than, than we'll ever know, and we feel terribly disadvantaged against him. But if we have the truth and he has lies, he has an unmeritorious case. Unmeritorious is the legal term for bullshit. Okay. Then damn it, he's got the blanks and we've got the live ammo. But one more thing is necessary. If you get out there in that match with Latham and say, wow, I've got live ammo I can't lose, draw your gun, fire wildly and completely miss the target. What happens? The referees go downrange with you. He has a blank target. You have a blank target. Score is tied 0-0. Zero, zero. He wins on form, doesn't he? And if you don't get the truth, it's not enough to have the truth on your side. You've got to get it across to the jury. Because if you don't get the truth across to the jury, the other man, far more skilled than you in legal tactics, will defeat you. And his unmeritorious lying case will prevail. So get the truth across to the jury. We'll discuss a couple of ways of doing that. Okay. First off, for example, when they attempt uh, destructive cross-examination on you, one of their tactics is an explosive, shocking, outrage question. For example, they'll look at you and say, Officer Peterson, is it not true that you have sex with chickens? Uh, what's the response? Now the camera zooms in. This is the response. It's sort of a sick smile. I wasn't expecting this. What's the jury thinking? He not only has sex with chickens, he enjoys it. If your reaction is to go, in shock, the jury's not thinking he's stunned by this outrageous question. The jury's thinking what's going through your mind is, how did they find out about the chickens? If you look at him and say, oh, no, as a matter of fact, I don't have sex with chickens. Well, what's the jury's response? My God, he's so cool about this. He must, must have been accused of the chickens before. This means where there's smoke, there's fire, there's something going on with him and these chickens. So what's the response? Do what the jury would, ex what any average male would expect your reaction to be to an outrageous bullshit question. Look at him and say, no, counsel, that is not true. That is a contemptible lie. Because that's the truth, isn't it? I hope it is. I don't see any feathers on your pants or nothing, kid. No, sir. Okay. <laughs> Be honest. Don't try to shield your emotions. Don't try to lie. Okay. Lawyers try to influence the jury and manipulate them and play them like a yo-yo. Don't you ever fall into this trap. Your great strength is you and the jury are closer to one another than the attorney is. They are laymen out of the community. You also are a layman in this matter. Okay. And if you try to pretend you're a lawyer, if you try to pretend you're going to play cute little games of influencing the jury like the lawyers do, you're doomed to failure. I'm going to give you right now three definitions of a jury that may serve you well in the future. 
The first I call simply the law school definition. Every attorney I've talked to at some point had a law professor say something to him like, you know you're in trouble when you realize that your life is in the hands of 12 people too stupid to get out of jury duty. That's the law school definition, guys. A jury is 12 people too stupid to get out of jury duty. And I absolutely disbelieve that. The attorneys may contemptibly feel that way about the jury. I do not. You'll find the jury is 6 to 12 people in the community who fully understand their responsibility, fully understand someone's life and career is in their hands. And they want to do their utmost to make certain that fairness and justice are served. Second definition comes closer to the truth from Robert Frost. A jury is 12 people assembled to determine who has the best attorney. And there is something to that. The two attorneys are the players, you are the stakes. And the jury is sort of the referee in all of this. I'm going to give you a definition that I think will serve you better, and if you cleave to it, by the time the trial is over, the jury is going to realize that you are the one sincerely telling them the truth and opposing counsel is not. And the LFI definition of a jury is this. A 12-headed creature with a collective IQ well in excess of 1,200, probably half a century of cumulative life experience, and 12 separately functioning bullshit detectors, several of which will be operational at any given moment during the trial. you find when you walk into the law offices, they'll have whole rows of books on their legal bookshelves on how to manipulate juries. Don't fall into that trap. You, to be honest, they'll see through it. Those 12... That lawyer is not going to hoodwink those 12 people. But if you try to pretend you're something you're not and try to bend the truth, I guarantee you those 12 people will see through it. Remember, too, when opposing counsel during cross-examination asks you a question and suddenly realizes, oh, no, I've opened Pandora's box. I've given the cop a chance to tell the truth. He's going to try to shut the door in your face. Don't. When he has asked the question, he has opened the door. Kick through it and get in there. He cannot shut you up and stop your answer. Case in point. Uh, my cross-examination uh, when I spoke for the defense in Florida versus Mary Hopkins, a woman who had uh, killed a vicious scumbag abuser in self-defense and was being tried for second-degree murder, lasted approximately 45 seconds. Okay, opposing counsel got up and attempted the standard impeachment of an expert witness, which is to make you appear a paid prostitute who's, you know, being paid to say whatever the lawyers want you to say. And just for the heck of it, we'll time it. He gets up and says, Mr. Ayub, you're normally paid for your appearances and things like this, and that's just the way they'll talk, sarcasm. I said, yes, counsel, I generally am. I said, and uh, tell the jury how much you charge. I said, uh, $1,000 a day in expenses. And tell the jury how much you've already been paid in this case. And he's going like this. I said, counsel, I haven't been paid a nickel, and I'm not billing a nickel. This is the first case I've taken for free. He says, you're doing it for free? I said, that's correct. We paused briefly. What's the single dumbest thing he could then have said? Why? I asked you why. <laughs> he says, why? because counsel, this case is an outrage. He says, objection! Pause briefly again. What are we conditioned to do when opposing counsel yells objection? Go. <laughs> no! No, he doesn't tell you to shut up, he can't. The big guy in the raven suit sitting behind the bench is the only one who can tell you to shut up. The door was open and I kept going through it. And he's yelled objection. I said, counsel, I have seen injustice before, but nothing like this. And he yells again, objection! The judge says, overruled counsel, you asked him the question. He goes, <laughs> no further questions. Uh, 47 seconds. Okay, when the door is open, kick through it. Get in it with the truth. Okay, you'll often have to do demonstrations for the jury. Okay, to show them how certain things happen. Always remember, keep it simple, keep it easily replicated. You want it to be a demonstration that the jury themselves can replicate later when they're alone in the deliberation room. Okay, and a classic example of that, in uh, Florida versus Officer Luis Alvarez, the officer had shot and killed a suspect who was drawing down on him with a hidden 22 caliber revolver. Opposing counsel said, no, that's manslaughter. His gun hand was still under the coat, even though you knew he had a gun. You should have waited to see the gun. I said, counsel, if you wait to see the gun, you're going to see what comes out of it. He said, no, 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 you, nobody can draw that fast. And fine, I did the demonstration. Okay, as I'll do for you now. The gun is unloaded. I want you to time me. When my hand starts to move, start the time. When the shot goes, stop the time. You missed that? Okay, we'll, we'll do it again. When the hand starts to move, start the time. When it stops, stop the time. Well, I didn't give you a warning. Well, Neville Johnson didn't give Officer Alvarez a warning either. 
Try it one more time, see if you can stop it. So what did we prove it? The gun can be drawn and fired once the hand is already on it faster than the human hand and eye can react enough to time. And one prosecutor said, well, you can do that, Mr. Ayub, but you do this stuff for a living. The Miami Herald called me a quick-draw gunman from New Hampshire. Miami Herald is to journalism what Yosef Mengele was to pediatrics, but I digress. Uh, he said, you can do that, you're a professional, but he couldn't have done that. And I said, no, counsel, any person on this jury can do it. And I looked at the jury, and look at them, talk to the jury. These are the ones you're here to speak to. I said, I would urge the jury, when the trial is over, to take Neville Johnson's gun into the jury room and see how quickly it can be drawn. They did so. At the end of the trial, the longest criminal trial in Florida history, with approximately 100 pieces of evidence entered, the jury took two pieces with them, Neville Johnson's 22 caliber revolver and his cardigan sweater. On the first vote, there was one to convict, and that woman said, I still don't think the officer was in that much danger. I think you should have waited to see the gun. And the foreman said, here, see, this is the unloaded gun. You take it. You try it. And she went, Bang. And I'm told that she looked down and said, he could have killed him, couldn't he? And then the foreman said, that's what we're trying to tell you. They took the second vote, and after the longest criminal trial in Florida history, the jury was out for two hours, including dinner, before they came back with the acquittal of Officer Alvarez. But it had been critical for the jury to be able to replicate so they could see and feel what was happening. Similarly, don't, don't expect a jury to take your word on faith any more than one of your police students will take your word on faith. They're cynical. They know what the stakes are. It has to be proven to them. But those of you who are police instructors know what. When, someone ha when you've helped the student to discover a truth for himself, that is the true learning experience. That is what he owns. Again, in Alvarez, the prosecutor at one point said rather contemptuously, well, Mr. Ayub, you're really just a Monday morning quarterback in all this, aren't you? I said, Counselor, every one of us in this room except Officer Alvarez is a Monday morning quarterback in all of this. But consider, your side has admitted that he had one second in which to decide, will I fire as this man turns on me or will I not? And you know, when you stop and think about it, Counselor, it's, there are 60 of those seconds in every minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 30 days in a month, and so on. When you start multiplying all those seconds and you realize the shooting took place December 28, 1982, and now it's March of 1984, you know, Counsel, when you multiply all that, it comes out to about 36 million some odd seconds. And that means, Counsel, you have had 36 million times as long to think about this as did Officer Luis Alvarez. There's no doubt in my mind that that night, when the sequestered jury went back to their motel rooms, every single one of them took a pocket calculator and a notepad and went 60 times 60 times 24. God damn, 36 million. And after the jury had come in with the acquittal, and they were mobbed by the reporters, who were asking, uh, why did you decide that way? Why did you acquit? And the foreman of the jury looked at the reporter and said, because the state's case was bullshit. Bless his heart. It was. Uh, a female juror looked at one of the reporters and snapped at him and said, are you kidding? The state had millions of times as long to think about this as the officer did to react. Okay, so what is your function there, particularly when you're an expert and material witness speaking as to your officer's training? You train the jury just as you trained him. Your function is to let the jury understand the dynamics the officer understood, which were the dynamics that made him decide he had to use the force that he did, or make the arrest that he did. Now remember also, as a general rule, any criminal record, criminal history, uh, negative character background on the suspect the officer was involved with will probably not be allowed into evidence unless it was known to the officer at the time he made the arrest or used force as he did. That is not, however, written in stone. Remember, follow the spirit of the law before the letter. In uh, one case in Florida, we were able to get what the court called a reverse 404B. 404B is the rule on that type of evidence that generally excludes it in the state of Florida. And the court ruled, based on a 40-page memorandum of law prepared by the police defense team, that in this case, the jury needed to know whether or not the man who was in their lethal encounter with the officer was a man who would be disposed toward violence. And on that basis, the judge allowed his record into court. And it was a rather extensive record that uh, made it clear to the jury what sort of man the officer had been dealing with and had been forced to kill. Okay, similarly, uh, well, again, in the Alvarez case, uh, we had been told beforehand, the jury is not to be told that the suspect's nickname given to himself was Snake. Because it wasn't known to the officer at the time of the shooting, ergo it would uh, unfairly bias them against the character of the deceased. So I, I, was, asked by, I was reminded by the judge before uh, the jury came into the room, uh, Mr. Abe, there will be no negative uh, characterizations about the character of uh, Neville Johnson. I said, yes, that's understood, Your Honor. 
And at one point, the prosecutor, uh, after I'd done the demonstration of how rapidly Johnson could have drawn and fired, saying, well, you're built differently than Neville Johnson. You couldn't have drawn that quickly. He couldn't have drawn that quickly. I said, counsel, I think he probably could have drawn more rapidly. Okay, he's a younger man than I. He's tall and slim, a body shape that we associate with flexibility and speed and agility. Indeed, a, a man so limber, he has nicknamed himself the snake. And you hear in the packed courtroom, the, <gasps> and the whole audience, prosecutor looks at me and goes, the jury's going, <laughs> looking at the prosecutor as if to say, say it ain't so, Joe. And the prosecutor looks at the juror, jury, uh, the judge rather, and he's, you know, expecting the lightning bolt to hit me. I glanced up and the judge goes, looks at me and goes, because I never said nothing about Neville Johnson's character. <laughs> but now what did the jury realize? I had told the truth. I had not lied. I had not cheated. I said nothing about Neville Johnson's character. The jury now realizes this is a man who calls himself Snake, and this guy didn't want us to know that. I wonder what else is going on that he doesn't want us to know. Tell us more, little witness. And that was the beginning of the opening of the door in that case. Remember also, you're trained in, uh, in your use of firearms. We don't shoot to kill, we shoot to stop. Well, if one continues the analogy that courtroom survival is the second stage of street survival, consider that you're up against a living entity, the case, the case with a capital C. In the sense of a corporation, it's a living entity unto itself. It wants to destroy you, your life, your career, everything you've worked for for your family and blotch the reputation of your department as well. Against the case, gentlemen, you don't shoot to stop, you shoot to kill. If they have a case woven of lies against a police officer, I don't want it just temporarily down and disabled. I want it dead. Indeed, I want it dead and buried with a wooden stake in its heart and a clove of garlic in its mouth, or it's going to come back up out of the grave. Once you're asked the question, if, for instance, you've got, say, six or seven reasons why it was necessary for the officer to make the stop or act as he did, don't start off and say, well, yes, it's justified first because of this, and I'll tell you why, and then you go on into that. Because opposing counsel is going to realize, oh, Lord, we've got a trick bag opened here. He's going to let the jury realize the cop is on the right. I've got to distract him and get him off. And as soon as you've finished point one, he's going to change the subject. And you can't come back and say, oh, gee, I had other things I wanted to talk to you about. Too late. He's got you off it, and six of the seven points that would have saved the officer are now lost. So when, when he asks you that question, begin by explaining there are several points and this is what they are. Bam, 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 every single one of them into the record. And then go back to the beginning and one by one illustrate your points. Okay, in one case where they were alleging the officer had cocked his revolver in violation of policy and it led to the death of the subject, there go uh, manslaughter, which was BS. The officer had fired double action deliberately when that man tried to draw and kill him and his partner. Okay, the allegation that the gun was cocked was the cornerstone of the case. It fell to me to break that and I was able to do so because the case was so goddamned weak in approximately one minute. Now, I got a lot of credit in that case that I didn't deserve. I was the one that wound up breaking that, uh, that cornerstone argument. But there was a reason they used me instead of the attorneys. Of the seven or eight points that we broke it with, I had only discovered two. The others had already been in place. What you had here was a very racially charged case. The, uh, the shooting had led to a riot in the city. It was a very sensitive matter. The officer was white. The one witness, the one single witness of the many who had said the gun was cocked was an angelic-faced 13-year-old black kid. Okay. And he had testified the gun was cocked. The prosecutors did not attack him on that. Okay. Or rather, the defense team did not attack him on that in cross-examination. I'll explain why shortly. But now I'm up speaking for the officer, and the prosecutor says, Mr. Ayub, you say you've analyzed the evidence and you don't believe the gun was cocked. And I said, that's correct. He said, then you don't believe in eyewitness testimony. I said, no, counsel, I don't accept the credibility of the single eyewitness who said the gun was cocked. And then, what should he have done? He should have shut up. And I argued later on summation, of course Ayub says that. Ayub's a cop himself. Now, he'll say anything for a cop. Now, which is BS, frankly, I won't, but that should have been his argument. But instead, bless his heart, he asked me, why? I said, counsel, Antonio Bell, the witness, is 13 years of age. He has less than the common knowledge of firearms has never even seen a real gun except a gun button a passing policeman's holster until this night in the dark through the tinted glass of the video arcade a measured 33 feet away it is clear from his sworn deposition prior to trial that he did not know what it was to cock a revolver until you the prosecutor showed him in your office and it's equally clear from that deposition that you or someone led him to believe the gun had to be cocked to fire he doesn't realize they work double action 
And counsel, for all these reasons, I cannot accept the credibility of Antonio Bell's testimony. It's about 42 seconds. Which time the prosecutor started stammering. He said, well, why didn't Mr. Black bring that up? Black was the attorney who had cross-examined the kid. I said, counsel, I have no idea, but I'm sure he has it waiting for you out there somewhere. And he did. It was waiting in trial. Now, why didn't Black cross-examine the young kid? Remember this from me. If your lawyer antagonizes the jury, if your lawyer does anything vicious, you are the one who will be punished for it. The jury sees defendant and, and lawyer as a unit. You and your attorney are Gemini. And for a white lawyer to have viciously attack this young black kid who, as far as he knows, is honestly and sincerely telling the truth, would have been the act of an animal. Why then did they use me? First, I'm an outsider. They don't associate me with the defendant that much. Second, I'm an ethnic myself. Okay, does Masada Yub sound like a wasp to you? <laughs> Third, did I ever attack the child? No, oh, who did I attack? Lawyer. He's fair game. Okay. We're running out of the end here for a uh, short roll call tape. Let me leave you with one final point. If at some point the prosecutor says something so outrageous that you literally have to laugh, obviously you've disturbed the decorum of the court and should apologize. And in such a case, I might well find myself saying if, if it were true, because I would only say it if it were true, Forgive me for laughing, counsel, but you've, you've just reminded me of a joke. And of course, if he doesn't ask you what the joke is, wouldn't you right now resent it if you didn't find out what joke we were talking about? Yeah. I have nothing else. Your attorney can, at the end, on redirect, say, by the way, what was that joke? I'm curious. I'll just say, well, counsel, I'm reminded of uh, the prosecutor who went to a bordello. And he paid his money, went up to a room with a fine-looking young woman, took all his clothes off, and the woman looks and realizes that his uh, male organ is only about a half an inch long. She looks at the prosecutor and says, who do you expect to satisfy with that? The prosecutor says, me. And I was reminded of that, counsel, because in this case, I think you've got a case about a half an inch long, and no matter how much you rub it and stroke it and flog it, it ain't going to get any bigger or any more impressive. It's never going to win an evidence measuring contest, and I think the only person this case is ever going to satisfy is you. Team, it's been my pleasure. I want you to watch out for the dorsal fins out there and keep your people safe. If I can ever help you, uh, the address for Lethal Force Institute is P.O. Box 122, Concord, New Hampshire, 03301. Feel free to, te feel free to telephone me at 603-224-6814. Thank you. Keep your people safe. <laughs>